Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with the Ecom Wiz podcast. And today my guest is John Cochran. He is co founder of Rise 25. Hey, John, thanks for being on the show. Rob, thanks for having me. So today we want to talk about one of John's specialties and one of the things that he is very dynamic at, and that's building strategic relationships to grow your e commerce business. And John, we're going to jump right into this and start talking about it. So why don't you talk about like, how, what is the importance of building a relationship and how does that correlate to the e-commerce or even the Amazon seller in the current 2020 timeframe we're in? Yeah, I mean, it's a great relevant question, right? Because I, I know tons and tons of sellers, including my business partner before we became business partners, he was a seller, um, still has a store. Um, and, and a lot of times I think the mentality is, well, I just need to get good at selling in this marketplace or I need to get really good at Facebook ads and selling products and all the different things, all the weeds you can get stuck in. And you think like, what's the importance of relationships? Or it's very easy to, to focus on all those various different details and not be worried or thinking about how to build relationships. But the truth is, I mean, as you mentioned, we're recording this in the middle of 2020. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. I can't tell you how many times I've heard of people turning on a critical relationship to help them with some challenge or some opportunity, whether it's your store gets shut down and you need help in getting it reinstated, or you want advice on getting a, sourcing a, a particular product or advice on Facebook ads or whatever, we all turn to relationships. And I know that it's been tremendously valuable for my career. I don't know a single person who wouldn't say the same thing. You know, it's, it's all about building great relationships and, and doing it really strategically and intentionally in a way that gives value to other people, that can really make a tremendous difference for your business. And so I'm just totally passionate about inspiring other people and giving them ideas and suggestions on how they can build great relationships that will help to fuel their business as well. Absolutely. And I mean, we're in this pandemic right now, but prior to this pandemic, John, when you'd walk into, let's say we went to a trade show, okay, and there's always these, you know, little after parties or get togethers like that. What would be one of the first things you would do when you'd walk into one of these that, and what kind of example or uh, advice could you give that when we get back to that, how they could use those to their advantage walking into a social get together? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I actually would, I'm often thinking about it even sooner than that, even earlier. So if you're heading into a trade show, you know, walking into it oftentimes um, is a little too late. I mean, you can still do great things and still make great people, but if you put a little bit of effort in on the front end, you can actually have a much better experience. So for example, my business partner, even before we became business partners, when we went to events, we would try and maybe put together a smaller gathering. And it could be as simple as you're going to a conference, you know, two or three other people who happen to go into that conference too, and you organize a coffee or a lunch or something like that with a couple of people, you bring them together, you become the person who's bringing people together. And that can really make a better experience. It can be a really positive experience, get to know those people a little bit better. Maybe it's a client or a supplier or whatever, or a strategic partner is going to be there. So just going in and doing that, and then also doing a little bit of homework beforehand to learn who's coming, who's going to be there, because there might be someone you've been really wanting to meet who's going to be there, or certain categories or types of people going to be there. So doing some research in advance, and then also deciding what types of events you're going to go to, what you know, what um, what sessions you're going to go to, what breakout sessions you're going to, you're going to go to, um, and, and this can get even bigger and bigger. I mean, my for us, like it started with doing small lunches and dinners with six people, eight people at our height, we did, you know, massive, like, uh, you know, dinner cocktail dinner parties with like 300 people there where eventually we just had all these people coming, but you don't need to do that. It can be a lot smaller. It can be a lot more modest, but just actually putting that effort in advance can actually lead to a better result. Um, when you go to that actual event. Yeah, I agree with you hundred uh, percent. I was going out to New York ASG TG beginning of this year. Uh, one of the things I did was put together a meetup and we ended up with uh, probably close to 40 people. And yeah. I hadn't been to New York, hadn't been to that event, but I'll tell you what, of those, I got several of them on the podcast, made great connections, uh, you know, and it's just like, it absolutely paid off and yeah. did the same thing right after that down in LA, went to another event through a meetup together. Uh, actually got, I made sure to get permission from the person who was throwing the event at that particular one. 
um, because they had their own after party and ours wouldn't conflict with it. But those things could definitely make a difference. I can tell you right now, John being on my podcast is because him and I meeting at IRCE in Chicago. Yep. And we, we ended up connecting, we ended up talking, and we ended up like communicating from that point on uh, on social media and stuff like that, just kind of touch and base. It wasn't always like we were always constantly talking, but we would occasionally touch base with each other, just kind of see how each other was doing. So what yeah. maybe, and what I'm trying to get at is maybe explain to everybody, like you go to these, you get these connections. A lot of people, they, they come back and they just fall right into their nine to five, right? And they don't always yeah. follow up on it or stay in touch. What can they do to make sure that they are, you know, what do they do with that contact information after to kind of make sure they keep it alive? Yeah. So I'm, you know, when I have that, where I've met someone at something, I'm looking for other ways to deepen that relationship, follow it up. And obviously it's never a perfect fit. Like you might meet 40 people at a conference and maybe not all of them are going to be great. It doesn't mean that you have to follow up with all those people. So I prioritize it 80, 20, right? Who are the most important? And then look for ways to deliver value to them and, and, and deepen that relationship. You know, do you, can you remember something from your conversation about, you know, something that they were focused on or needed help with or a piece of advice mm -hmm. that they needed? And it doesn't have to be related to your vocation. So, you know, if you do, you know, Facebook ads for e-commerce sellers, that doesn't mean that you have to launch into telling them all about how to optimize their Facebook ads. It might look a little bit salesy if you do that, but rather if like you had a conversation with them at the conference about how their daughter was going off to college in a couple of weeks and wasn't sure about going off to college and whether it was going to be safe. And maybe you can give them some advice on a great face mask or, you know, boy, in the yeah. future, this is not going to age well, but for now, <laughs> for now it works well, but you know, you can give them some advice on, you know, what they can do. And, and that's going to be more meaningful for, for people, especially if it's of a, of a personal nature. Um, it, that can be really helpful and it allows to deepen the relationship. And then what we're doing here, right here, I'm a huge advocate of this. I've been doing a podcast for about 20, for about 10 years. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, doing some kind of feature interview um, is a great excuse to take that relationship further, whether it's you publish it on YouTube, whether it's you publish it in an article, whether it's you publish it on your website or you publish it as a podcast or however you do it, but creating co-creating content with someone in the form of just an interview is, you know, a great way to then, it's a great excuse to then take that relationship a little bit further and create something at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. And then let, let's also talk a little bit about like leads. Okay. Uh, everybody wants more qualified leads. Uh, what are some of the mistakes that people make when, uh, you know, with regarding lead generation? Yeah. Well, one is, uh, I kind of mentioned it a second ago is trying to go straight for the sale too quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to be salesy, you know, we're all on LinkedIn and I think the biggest turnoff when people, um, get on the LinkedIn platform is, is being hit up by people trying to sell them immediately. Um, so I'm a big believer in zigging when everyone else is zagging. So, you know, if you lead with like a content strategy, like I was talking about, um, it's a lot better approach. Uh, or if you at least don't try and sell people immediately, you try and deliver value to them in some way. That's a lot better strategy. Um, and, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, looking for leads in the right places, you know, a lot of times people are just a spray and pray kind of strategy. I found, you know, you know, people like will join a lot of groups or they'll go to a lot of events. And as you mentioned, you know, just maybe going to one or two events that you know is really powerful, really valuable for your business, but then taking that further rather than just coming home and sticking all those business cards in a drawer, but actually like following up and deepening the relationship with, with the people who you met at that conference who you can tell are going to be valuable for your business. Yeah. That could be a better use of your time than going to five or six or 10 trade shows and not actually continuing to follow up with those people. Cause then you're just basically dooming yourself. You're going to be stuck on the hamster wheel of having to go back again and again, and not actually deepening those relationships, taking them further. Yeah. Let's talk a little more about LinkedIn. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. I've got over 5,000 uh, connections. They've all been handpicked. I've all made sure that they're Amazon sellers, Amazon agencies, like they are in the Amazon world. I only want, my group of LinkedIn people to be people that I have a connection with that when I post content, it's content they're going to like, they're going to reply to, they're going to respond. I feel that that's more valuable 
than having 100,000 people who are just VAs and people who are just not related to, because I get to spam yeah. daily. And I'm sure yeah. you do too. So, yeah. you know, let's talk a little bit about that. What the approach, John, like I have an approach I use that is, is very neutral. It's kind of more like a introduction of myself, ask him if there's anything I can help him with. You know, I'm in this Amazon world. I just don't go out there and be like, and, and say, Hey, go try feedback whiz and use our software. It's the best. You know, it's like, yeah. cause I get hit with those. I feel, yeah. I feel I don't ask that person until maybe two or three conversations in, and it's gotta be the right moment. Like if I still feel like it's not the right moment to ask them to try our software, I'll just let it be. I won't even ask because mm -hmm. I'd rather have the subtle approach because it's already all over my profile, what we do. It's already all over my profile, who I work for. Mm -hmm. So eventually they're going to go look up who is this guy? What has he done? Who, where has he worked? Do you kind of agree with that or do you have a little different approach and what kind of tips can you give? Yeah, no, I agree. I think that um, trying to get into the conversation at the right point in the conversation is a bit of an art, art form. Some people, they don't do a good enough job of it. And then they awkwardly try and get into that conversation around like, what are you doing in order to get good feedback? Like, yeah. just kind of like awkwardly, awkwardly into it. But if you lead from a point of value, um, if you lead from a point of how can you contribute, give some advice or expertise, with no strings attached, then they're going to want to know more and they're going to want to reciprocate in some way. That principle of reciprocity is incredibly powerful. So, you know, if you take some time to look at their LinkedIn page, for example, and it turns mm -hmm. out, oh, they're selling products in a category that you sold in, you'd be like, hey, have you looked at this idea or have you looked at, um, you know, are you doing this in order to get feedback or whatever? you know, in a, in a, from a place of not like, Hey, go try the software, but rather like, this is a strategy you might not have thought of, or this is a hack, or this is an idea that might help you. Um, when you do that and the person sees that it comes from a place, uh, that is genuine and, and just wanting help, then they're going to, that builds the trust, trust level with you. And they're going to want to know more and they're going to be more open to a conversation or they're going to be open to the idea around maybe this guy has got other solutions out there that might be helpful to me, such as software. Yeah. I, I, there's times I approach different companies and one of the things I do is I actually go look on, on Amazon and see if they're selling and I look at their feedback and it's like, uh, you know, for their products. And I, if I see that their feedback's really low, I'll, I'll go to them and I'll be, and I'll ask them, you know, Hey, I was looking at your products. Hey, that's a great product. You know, I'm really surprised you're not getting more feedback, uh, you know, product reviews on this. Or there's even a time I'll go there and I'll see that they have tons of product reviews and I'll take a different approach and go, hey, I noticed you guys have a really good product. You're getting lots of product reviews. What kind of strategy are you guys using to get those product reviews? Are you using certain wording or, you know, what kind of titles, description, you know, what, what are you doing to do it? And kind of ask them because I feel sometimes I, I can always learn. We can always learn from somebody else. So I kind of take that approach that there's two different ways. And, and that's before being, a, I'm not there to be a salesperson. I'm a marketing person, but yes, sales come with it. Yeah. But I'm trying to establish a relationship with them because you just never know, right? You never know when, let's say that person that has a ton there, you know, we release a new piece of software, then they're like, oh yeah, hey, that's pretty cool. They're, let's go get that one. And that's the truth, right? I mean, there, it could be that they've been stuck at three stars and they're like beating their head against the wall. They don't know how to improve that. Yep. And they're going to be thrilled to have met you, you know? So uh, I think it, it is helpful to get into that conversation, get them into that point in the conversation. Cause what a lot of people do is like, Hey, how do you like selling on Amazon or something that's like way yeah. too broad. And then it's hard and awkward to get to the other, to, to really where they want to be in conversation with that person. Yep. So I think it's okay to, to, uh, to, to, to get further along into that conversation, but from a point of delivering value. And it does take a little bit of effort, like you said, going onto the Amazon, looking on their store, or you know, at, at a minimum, looking at their LinkedIn page and seeing what Absolutely. their business is about. Um, but, I, but I think you, that's even better, is going the extra step of looking at their Amazon store, looking at their feedback, you know, looking, is it good, is it bad? Um, should they be getting more of it? You know, and yep. then, cause, because people love that kind of expertise, you know, they, they love that sort of thing. You know, when I started my podcast 10 years ago, I was practicing law um, and I would have people on all the time and, and 
at the end of the interview, they would be like, hey, can I ask you a legal question? And of course, I was thrilled, right? Because I'm interviewing a lot of referral partners and strategic, you know, uh, potential clients and stuff like that. But they were thrilled to have the opportunity to ask a lawyer a question who wasn't billing by the minute, right? <laughs> so they, they were like thrilled by that. And it often led to great further client engagements, you know? Sometimes it didn't. Many times it didn't. Sometimes yeah. it did, you know? But it, it came from a place of like, I want to I give you some advice. I want to help you out. And, and at some point, it'll come back to me. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Uh, every three out of five people I have on the podcast, as soon as they find out that I'm actually YouTube certified and have done a pretty extensive YouTube uh, marketing, they're mm. always at the end of the podcast after we get off the air, they're like, wait, Rob, could you look at our YouTube channel with you? And yeah. I'm like, yes, I'll help you out. Uh, you know, and they're like, we'll pay. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I mean, I got a full-time job and everything yeah. and I love what I do. But yeah, if I get a couple minutes, you know, when I get done with work, I'll try to take a look at it and give you a couple bits of advice here and there. But it's, you know, I've even been asked a couple of times like, Rob, are you should start a consulting on doing YouTube. And I'm like, that's not what I want to do. I love <laughs> what I'm doing. I love the role <laughs> I'm in. But yeah, but not to get off topic, but John, so let, let me ask you, you brought up the podcast show. So let's talk a little bit about what role does a podcast play in lead generation? I mean, I kind of know, but why don't you explain to everybody yeah. else? Well, I think, you know, podcasts have, have been really hot in recent years. And I think a lot of people are, are listening to them now. They're paying attention to them, a lot, lot more awareness than when I started 10 years ago. But I think a lot of times people uh, have a very simple view of where, what it can be, you know, they th or a, kind of a one-dimensional view, whereas a, a podcast can be so much more. So I view it as like a Swiss army knife. It's not just about content marketing, which it, it, that is one of the ways to yeah. utilize it, but it's really about up leveling your network. It's about a tool for business development. It's a tool for referral marketing. You will get many more high caliber relationship referrals if you do it right using a podcast than you would otherwise because it's a lot easier to refer to people who have a podcast. It's a tool for client acquisition. It's a tool that is personal and professional development, which doubles as content at the same time. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all these different things and many times at the same time. And so the reason that I've continued to do it for 10 years, even though I have four young kids right now, is because I know that it would be more time consuming to not have the podcast than to have the podcast. And because I just love using it as a tool to be able to talk to really smart people and to be able to ask them questions that I'm curious about, which I would not normally be able to do for free <laughs> unless yeah. I was paying them for their time because I'm creating content that I'm gonna share on the internet that's gonna be up on the web for years to come. So I'm a huge zealous, I'm, I'm a huge zealous advocate of it. I tell everyone that they should do it. If you know, not for, you know, professional reasons, for personal reasons, because you will make great connections, you'll make great relationships, you'll meet great people. And the really the virtues, the value of it um, continues going on and on and on. I've made more connections the last year and a half with the podcast than I could have ever thought of. I mean, if yeah. I had just gone on Facebook and tried hitting people up and talking to them, sure, you'll make a few. And, uh, you know, between the podcast, hosting meetup events that we did prior to COVID, uh, man, so many connections, you know, going yeah. to trade shows, talking to people, talking to you. I mean, it definitely, there's, there's so many connections out there. I value every one of them and they help tremendously. And the way I kind of, I approach our podcast very similar to what you did. I mean, I had a whole background of a YouTube channel that was a DIY channel. We gave all the information out for free. We, and people just automatically went to our website and bought stuff. We never even told them to, we just provide mm -hmm. the information. And that's kind of the way I feel with the podcast is I want to get people on and we want to share information that benefits people that are listening and they'll find out about both of us, the, the guest that's on. And of course, I mean, yeah, I mentioned feedback was here and there, but I don't, I don't make it a point to plug it. You know, it's just, I use it as an example or when, when it's, you know, a natural fit. So yeah. you were talking about the podcast, you know, taking, not taking, well, how much time do you spend on podcasts? Let's ask that. How much time? Yeah. Um, I, you know, like weekly. I, yeah. So I, I prefer to look at it a little bit differently. You know, the, the, I think the question you have to ask yourself is, well, first of all, those who do a podcast, you would be spending that time doing business development, up-leveling your network, connecting with people, whether you do a podcast or not. 
you know, unless you're just living like a hermit and you're not trying to connect with anyone. But most people who are engaged in business, you want to connect with people. You want, you're going to networking events, you're going to meetups, things like that. You know, the, the podcast, I actually firmly believe it will save you time. I remember Absolutely. talking to a client a year or so ago. He was in the midst of going to a conference that was one day of travel getting there, two days of conference, another day of travel coming back. It was four days out of the office. In that amount of time, I can do probably a year's worth of podcast interviews. And the thing is, is like you will get access to higher and higher caliber people than you probably would otherwise. You know, if I go to a conference and the keynote speaker is done and there were 100 people or 500 people in the room and then 40 people bum rush the stage and I get, I'm in much, amidst these 40 other people and I'm trying to get an opportunity for 20 seconds to talk to this person, that's not a great scenario. Yeah. Versus like, I can get almost any keynote speaker on my, on my podcast just by reaching out to them in between gigs, especially right now, they're not yeah. traveling, going to conferences. And, and they're happy to get the exposure. So I get a 45 minutes over Zoom. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to denigrate in person. I'm a big fan of in person, but you know, especially if they live in another city, if they live 3000 miles away, you're in San Jose, I'm up near San Francisco, just north of San Francisco. So even across the Bay Area, like it, you know, it's a lot harder to do something face to face. So actually it, 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 it eliminates that geographic limitation. So there's all those you know, benefits really like are, are reasons why you should do it. Yeah. And technology's there now. I mean, it, it has been there for quite a few years, you know, and it's just gotten better and better. I mean, we're, we're doing this sitting in our houses. Quality's great. The audio's great. And we're just absolutely, uh, you know, right. I, I enjoy the podcast. It, I feel it's just really, I kind of feel it's just an extension of my personality anyways. I mean, you put me in a room full of people and I'll just start talking to everybody and my wife absolutely hates it, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> She doesn't well, hate it, but she knows that's the way I am. So. And what's really cool is then people listen to it and then you meet someone like at a conference or an event or something like that and they've listened to a bunch of your podcasts yep. and they feel like they know you, you know, and they'll make a comment like, wow, you sound in person just like you do on the podcast, you know? <laughs> but they, they, I find that people have much more trust for you if they've listened to some of your podcasts because you've been in their earbuds, you know? Yeah. They've been listening to you. They know a little bit more about how you think, how you talk, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really valuable from that perspective and getting people, because that's hard, right? Getting people to trust you is, that's a big part of the early elements of, of a relationship. So yeah. if you can create content that you create once and then people listen to over and over again, not consuming any of your time, consuming their time, and then they come to you much stronger, much like higher level of trust for you, that's a great use of your time. That's, that's a, another area in which, that's another reason why I say it can save you a lot of time. Absolutely. Now, what about John? I mean, we've, we've been doing the podcast only about a year and a half. You going on 10 plus years, I think you said. Uh, I, I, we've been trying to take our podcast like another level. I'm going after higher cal caliber people. And I'm not saying anybody's been on. I mean, everybody's been on is high caliber. And that, especially this year, we really had a lot of people step up. But I'm going after some like big time speakers right now to try to get them on for next year. And it's hard to get someone to say yes, or I feel like I'm getting caught in their bot on Facebook or what, how do you get like, what's your approach to get some of those maybe bigger speakers on your show? Well, so first of all, I would say, um, you know, I've had many big names on the show. I've had, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, Guy Kawasaki, you know, some, yep. some those are you know, huge. big entrepreneurs, founders, stuff like that. Um, I'm still waiting for Gary Vaynerchuk to send me a referral, right? <laughs> nice. The thing is, is like a lot of the bigger names, like it doesn't really move the needle for them to be on yet another podcast. Yeah. It does, you know, whereas like featuring someone who isn't on a podcast all the time, it really makes a difference for them. Like they're going to share it on LinkedIn. On, they're going to tell their family and friends about it. It's going to really make a big difference for them. And they might turn into a zealous advocate of yours who refers five, 10, whatever, clients, customers to you or over what period of time, it, it could be a lot more valuable for you. A lot of times those big names, those big gurus, where they are valuable is they are social proof for you because mm -hmm. you can say subsequently to other people, I've had so-and-so on or I've had so-and-so on. And then other people want to be a guest because they want to be kind of on the same platform. I remember one podcast I was on like a year and a half ago, um, Tony Robbins was the episode two episodes before me. And I felt like a million bucks. Like, ah, oh, I couldn't believe that I 
<laughs> well, yeah, exactly right. So that's where it can be really valuable to you. Okay, so first, with that caveat, having said that, as far as outreach and getting those bigger name guests on there, it's really helpful to position it in a way, one, where it's kind of a velvet rope, so you're not just letting anyone on there. And secondly, you got to stair step your way up. So you get better, bigger and bigger people to the point where they want to go on because others that they know, like, and respect have been on there. So that to the go, get to the point where you can say like, hey, you know, whoever it is, like Tony Robbins, I've had on, and then you list like five names of people that he knows, he respects, and so that he doesn't need to ask any more questions. You know, that person, whoever it is that you're trying to get on, just immediately hears that and they say, oh, if so-and-so was on, then how could I say no? Or if so-and-so was on, I, I believe I'm the same category as that group of people. And so I want to be a guest on that show as well. You know, so it's actually when you stair step your way up, eventually you get to the point where it's like, well, why would they possibly say no if all these other people have said yes? Obviously, yeah. yes, of course, I'll do that. And then also positioning it as, you know, like for example, the top founder series, the top e-commerce seller series, the top, you know, beauty seller series. And then you get a couple of names on there and pretty soon it's their competitive juices start flowing. Like, oh, I'm a top beauty category sell seller as well. Like I want to be in that group as well. And so of course they're going to say yes too. So again, positioning it as something where it is respected uh, and they're in a coveted group of people that um, is, you know, that they want to kind of consider themselves to be in that group, that can go a long way as well. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent on that. And yeah, I mean, we, we are always looking for people to get on, you know, and I like, I like finding some of the people that are kind of up and coming because I feel sometimes they'll provide a little more information sometimes that, you know, like they're more willing to kind of go out on a limb and give more info. Now, what about, you know, we're, now we're talking more about trying to tell people on how to build strategic relationships to grow their e-commerce business. And we're just right now, John and I are talking about, you know, kind of having your own podcast, but there could be some people that are kind of like, you know, am I a little too late to start a podcast? Is it a little bit crowded right now? What's your response to that, John? So first of all, I say that you are unique and the way that you would do a show is completely different from the way that anyone else would do a show. And even if it's a crowded field that you're in that you want to create a podcast in, it doesn't matter because it's about the relationships. Mm -hmm. And you are depriving yourself of building those relationships if you're worried about some inconsequential competition factor. You know, yeah. it, you don't even need to be the top of charts. Like it doesn't really even matter. And actually, by the way, podcasts are kind of a big black box because about between 50 and 70% of the downloads come through Apple and mm -hmm. Apple doesn't disclose download numbers. So if you go on iTunes and you search for top 100 podcasts, I've done this before. There's about 9,000 results. I'm pretty sure mathematically <laughs> it's not possible that 9,000 people are in the top 100 podcast. Everyone's lying about it, okay? Yeah. So if you can't believe that, then it doesn't matter whether you're a top of shows or top of, of the charts or not. And in addition to that, what I just described earlier, you can position yourself, you can position yourself against people coming on by explaining all the other people that you've had on and using that as an element of social proof or even, or, or even your expertise too, right? Let's not forget that. Maybe you have really impressive background. Maybe you've built an amazing selling machine. Maybe you've built an amazing business. And so they may be interested in talking to you. Maybe you have YouTube expertise. Maybe they have something that they are curious about that they know like, wow, this would be really interesting to be interviewed by this guy who knows a lot about how to optimize YouTube videos because that's an area I'm, I'm kind of struggling with and I'd love to ask him about it maybe when the interview's over. People do think about that sort of thing. So that's Absolutely. important as well. So I yeah. uh, hope that answers your question. No, that, yeah, that is. So I mean, basically what we're saying is I, I kind of feel, you know, if they're going to start a podcast, find, find a niche, find a niche that you are, you know, passionate about, uh, you have some knowledge about, I mean, uh, looking back now, I wish I started a podcast regarding, you know, the iPhone repair and doing repairs and stuff. I, I probably would have blown up and been huge. I yeah. mean, but I don't remember really podcasts there. Well, 10 years ago, you said you started a podcast. So yeah, I guess they were around. 
Well, so yeah, definitely yeah, there. I mean, the other thing you brought up was about um, whether it's too late. I mean, I actually think it's easier now than it was then because people know what a podcast is and it's a lot easier to get them. It's a lot easier to download them. You can get them directly from your phone. I mean, 10 years ago, they weren't, oftentimes it wasn't on the phone or you had to, you know, you had to take your iPod and connect it up to your computer, download it through iTunes first to your computer and then sync them over. It was a pain in the butt. Now it's, now it's like car makers are starting to build it directly into the interface, into the entertainment system so you can listen directly there. So we're actually, there's a lot of potential, I believe. There's a lot of opportunity and people understand it a lot more. They know that there's an array of content out there that they can find. So I think in many ways it's easier and it's easier to get people to say yes to be a guest on podcasts because they understand it and it's still new and exciting for people. Yeah, let's also talk. Uh, let's talk a bit about you know sellers in the e-commerce world, and let's just start with just Amazon sellers. What's the importance of them diversifying right now with the way things are going on with not just COVID, but I mean Amazon's going through the roof, and it probably is going to dominate for quite a few years. But what happens if they get suspended, or you know they have an issue, or they they can't get their product anymore? So, you yeah. know, let's kind of switch gears a little here, John, and talk a little bit about, you know, what's the importance of diversifying? I'm just a huge fan of diversification in any industry, in any kind of company. I don't like having all my eggs in one basket for the exact reasons that you mentioned. And, you know, remember, I practiced law for many years, so I experienced this with clients in all kinds of different scenarios where people they didn't even realize how much their eggs were in one basket so to speak i mean and this year has been really truth of that i mean some of the most respected admired entrepreneurs and companies out there you know now because of this global pandemic just were brought to their knees or were completely crippled in a short period of time and they didn't realize that that they were not diversified. So I, I just think it's tremendously important. And we can get into the reasons why, because Amazon could shut down your account or because your supplier you know, stops selling or starts competing with you or whatever. There's, all, there's many different ways it can happen, but it's just important that you diversify against all of those different types of scenarios. And I kind of jokingly said when I was practicing law that you don't hire a lawyer to assume everything's gonna be rosy you hire a lawyer to assume that everything is going to go to crap and that's why you pay them. And so they, you know, the, as part of the reason that I wasn't too crazy about practicing law is that you're always dreaming up nightmare scenarios, which is a lot of fun, right? You know, you think about, Oh, how could everything go horribly? Um, but it, it is a helpful exercise, you know, for your business. Think about, okay, what if this happened? What if my key manager leaves? What if my entire content team goes on strike and they refuse and they want more money? What if my supplier refuses to sell to me? What if my Amazon account gets shut down? What if my YouTube account gets shut down? All yeah. of these different types of scenarios. Think about those things. And what if that did happen? What do you do? You know, I mean, I had a mentor who said like, you know, if you find that any one of your clients or sources of revenue, and by the way, it could be client, it could be geographic source of revenue, it could be demographic source of revenue. If it grows to over 20%, you should not cut it off. It's okay to have it, but that means that you should be putting more effort into diversification so that that 20% lowers down and so it's not such a, a large chunk. Because I don't know any business that if, they, if you got 20% of revenue ch you know, chunked off tomorrow, just completely eliminated, it's going to oh, yeah. sting a bit, right? So that's really, it's really important to think about how you can diversify in all those different ways, not just, you know, supplier, but, you know, geographically, demographically, um, all those different ways. Yeah. It, it, so John and I could probably keep going on and on, but I want you guys to listen to this because we're going to go into a little bit of John's background and there's some really interesting stuff. He's worked in the White House. Now, before we get to that whole area of John working in the White House and what he did, why don't you kind of go back a little further, John? What, what, what did you do in college and kind of what led that whole process up to working in the White House? Yeah, so it was kind of a crazy experience. So I actually, um, in college, um, I interned in the White House and I just applied for the regular internship program. Um, you know, I, the only interesting thing I'd done immediately prior to that was I had um, run I've been like the campaign manager for a guy who ran for student body president at my college. 
which seems pretty silly in retrospect, but you know, it was like somewhat relevant, I guess. I don't know if it qualifies you to work at the white house really, (laughs) but I probably made an argument that it did. And um, so, yeah, I just uh, applied through the regular way. Obviously, you know, I I sent in writing samples and I got accepted to work in the speech writing office. And I just, when I got there, it's like when you get that opportunity, then you got to make the most of it, you know? And the interns, you know, were not paid. I imagine they still aren't. Um, but I worked my butt off. I worked as hard as I could. I wanted to make a great impression. I wanted to, um, have them want me around. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at what ended up happening is I went up going back to college after that experience and I kept in touch with the speech writers and when an, uh, you know, writing job opened up, one of them let me know about it, you know, contacted me and, and, you know, it's not like, Jobs back then, I don't even know where they advertised jobs back then, but it wasn't like you were going to find one on Craigslist at the White House, right? You know, so it's <laughs> pretty much not. word of mouth. Ma- pretty much word of mouth. And I heard about it, I applied for it, and I ended up getting it. You know, so it was it was about like when an opportunity presents itself, you got to take advantage of it. You got to work as hard as you can in order to make the most of it. And how did that fall in line with the law degree? Did you do that prior to going to get your law degree? That was later. That was later. And that was actually part of it. I got a law degree in part because I worked in politics. And after that, I was a speechwriter for a governor of California. And, you know, from that experience, you know, many of the people that I worked with, both in the governor's office and the White House, now they're members of Congress, they're they're judges, um, they've become founders of amazing companies. They were really smart people. And I would find myself yeah. being in rooms and meetings and stuff like that. And I would lose arguments to other people that were more persuasive than me. And I looked around and I'm like, uh, that guy's a lawyer, that guy's a lawyer, that guy's a lawyer, she's a lawyer. Maybe I should go to law school. So I ended up going to law school, not necessarily because I wanted to become a lawyer, but because I was losing arguments and I wanted to win <laughs> arguments. So I was a little competitive. And, um, and frankly, I wanted to know how the world works. And what podcast, what, sorry, podcast, what, what lawyering, what going to law school actually taught me was that I can figure stuff out. It taught, it taught me that no matter how complex the world gets, I'm confident that I can figure it out. And that's really the most important lesson that I think you can get from really any degree. And that's why I ended up doing it. All right. I think you forgot to mention who was in the White House when you were working there. So I was there in the Clinton years. So dating myself now is a while ago now. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I mean, you know, it was the kind of experience where I would, you know, be head down working on writing something, a video script, a message, a proclamation or whatever. Um, and then I'd get up, you know, it it was, it was moments of like amazingness and something mundane. So like I'd be working on something that, you know, I know is going to go across the president's desk and he's going to read it. And he's either going to like, be like, this is crap, cross it out and be like, send it back, which is like, I'm sure, you know, not a good scenario for me or, or sometimes like he, he, they would make a copy and he'd write, be like, thanks, great letter. And it'd come back to us and just feel like a million bucks, you know, or it's something that ended up getting, you know, press coverage or something like that. Um, So I knew this stuff was going to be slid across his desk at the Oval Office, you know? And then other times I'd like go to the restroom and then (laughs) in the hallways, there's the president of the United States arguing with another world leader away from the press, wow. away from anyone seeing anything, surrounded by Secret Service and the other world leaders, um, their security equivalents. Team. Yeah, security. Yeah. And like having a heated argument wow. with no one around, you know, about something that I, I couldn't even hear because it was a distance away. And this, the Secret Service would be there saying, I'm sorry, sir, you can't go any further. And I'm standing there thinking on one hand, this is insane to see this happening. And thinking on the other hand, I really have to pee. I hope they don't talk for <laughs> too long. I don't want to have to turn around. I can't. They told me I can't move. You know, so like just kind of funny things like that. Uh, wow. But yeah, just, just being around the experiences uh, was amazing um, and, and being there and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's awesome. And thank you for sharing that. That's absolutely a great story. Uh, tell us uh, what was kind of the journey that led you to uh, – Dr. Jeremy Weiss and yourself co-founding Rise 25. Yeah. How'd that come about? Yeah. I mean, I didn't intend to do that, but um, so I practiced law for many years, started my, my legal practice in 2011, uh, my own law practice. Um, and I did that for a number of years. And shortly after that, I realized practicing law kind of can suck. Um, and also you're, you're kind of on a hamster wheel. You're constantly trying to get new clients and mm. billing and all that kind of stuff. So I looked for other opportunities and I eventually kind of built a blog and a podcast, 
which eventually replaced my income as a lawyer. Took a little while to do, but eventually it did. Um, and, and then Jeremy and I hooked up a couple of years later and we, um, we were both going to a conference and we did a, a small event together and we really enjoyed doing it. And so we just kept on going. And the first couple of years, we did a lot of events. We would partner with conferences and we do our own events, a little like usually mastermind format types of events. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, eventually, and then this goes back to the diversification argument. I realized we oh, too many eggs were in one basket. I didn't anticipate a pandemic coming along. Of course not. Mm-hmm. But I realized that, you know, we needed to get on an airplane in order for our revenue. We needed to go to events in order for our revenue. And I had young kids at this point, And I was like, I don't want that to be the case anymore. So we need to diversify away from event-based revenue. So our goal was to go from about 90% event-based revenue for our entire business down to about 10%. And this year, we definitely would have been under 10%. And then, of course, the whole pandemic hit. And so we were, we were well under this year, uh, but it was, really, it was really a smart decision for us that we made that shift over from that in, in order to diversify. And, and, and we love, have both been podcasting since uh, for about 10 years, both of us, about 20 years between the two of us. And we love everything about it. We are contrarians in the industry because we're all about using it to uplevel your network, get clients, get Absolutely. ROI. It's really critically important. And so we just kind of, naturally started our team lending our team out and using our team to help other people with the done with the production aspects so people wouldn't have to worry about that and it just kind of took off you know and the pandemic actually has accelerated our growth because people realize they still want to build relationships but they can't travel to do it or they can't go to coffee or they can't go to lunch to do it but they still want to build relationships and the podcast is a great tool for that Absolutely. Absolutely. So John, I, I appreciate you being on the Econ Wiz podcast. Uh, real quick before we go, uh, just kind of plug, how do they get a hold of Rise25, the website? Also be sure to tell them your podcast because I listen to your podcast. It's amazing. Totally different Thank audience you. and totally different guest space than what we have on here. But if you love e-commerce and kind of just love the world of e-commerce, John has a great perspective and a, a totally different guest list than we do on here. But John, go ahead. Yeah, sure. My, well, my podcast is Smart Business Revolution. You can hear it on anywhere you can find podcasts. Um, and Rise25 is our website for the Rise25 business and primarily working with B2B businesses to help them to get ROI and clients and build great relationships using a podcast. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Be sure you say, hey, I heard you on Robbie's show. Um, <laughs> that definitely will, will grab my attention and I love to hear that. So uh, uh, definitely reach out. You can also email me, John at rise25media.com if you want, J-O-H-N at rise25media. There you go. And I'll be sure to put all that information in the description or the YouTube video. It'll be in the description there also. And uh, John, thanks again for being on the EcomWiz podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.